Okay. We're going to do our last bit on springs today. Uh, we're going to do extension springs like this one. They usually have hooks or they have to have some kind of connection on the end of them. So some sort of hooks like these on the end. Um, they don't always look exactly like this, but uh, they will have some way to connect on the end. Um, and then we'll do torsion springs. So these would be in something like this, you know, so there's a torsion spring in there. Um, we'll do those two as far as calculations. Um, there are other types of springs, um, like you might have seen just a spring that's a flat bar and it's a leaf spring or, or a round bar and it's a torsion rod. Um, those, um, we won't specifically go into detail with how to calculate those. They're, they're actually a little, uh, well, it depends on the situation, I guess. Some of the flat bars aren't flat, you know, they're, they're tapered and so that creates a variable spring rate that we might have to deal with. Um, but we're going to calculate these two. In fact, these two exact springs, we're going to look at this one, uh, the extension spring here, and calculate uh, how much force it's going to need to pull apart. Uh, there's some amount of force you have to apply before it even begins to pull apart. Notice this one, uh, this extension spring is different from the um, compression springs where all the coils already are touching. That's not always true with extension springs, but a lot of times it is. Um, where there's some amount of force you have to pull with before it even separates the coils, they're coil bound. So when they make these particular kind of springs, um, not only do they wrap it around a mandrel, but they, they twist the wire as it's going around the mandrel, and that makes it want to be shorter than it actually is. It can't get any shorter because all the coils are touching one another. Um, and so there's a, a preload on it. So there's amount of force you have to apply before it stretches. So we'll calculate that. Calculate spring rate. Um, with these, you also have to uh, think about, well, it might be that the little hooks holding the spring onto whatever it's attached to, they might fail. And so there's two particular points that we'll look at there. <clears throat> we'll look at one point, you know, this little curve right here might fail. And then another one, you know, right in here, it might straighten out the, the curvature there and uh, fail uh, that way. So we'll look at those stresses. There's a bending stress here, shear stress here. We'll look at the regular shear stress that we've been. It's actually the same equation that we've been using before for the body uh, coils. Um, we'll look at all that. And then we'll go over to this guy um, and we'll calculate. Um, it has a different kind of spring rate, um, at least the one we're going to calculate. Um, here, you know, it's pounds per inch that you stretch the spring. That's kind of the way you describe this spring rate. And on this guy, um, it's uh, torque per turn. So how much torque you have to apply to make it rotate a whole 360 degrees, like this point to move back around to there. How much torque would you have to apply to do that? Now normally they're not gonna uh, twist that far. Usually these have a pretty limited range of motion, you know, maybe, maybe that far, something like that is about all they're gonna do. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we'll calculate torque per turn. Uh, for that, we'll calculate, you know, how much force do we need to apply to get this back in. You know, it came out of this guy, a bigger version of this one. Um, so it's bigger than where it goes, so you have to squeeze it down to be able to put it back in there. So how much force do you have to apply to squeeze it back down? So we'll calculate that. Um, but let's start with this one. Let's get these out of the way for now. So this is an extension spring. The point of it is as you stretch it longer, uh, then it is going to require more in, uh, force to stretch it out. Um, this is chapter 10, 11, extension springs. And um, I've gone ahead and I've measured, took, uh, probably should use a micrometer, but I didn't want to go find my micrometer wherever I put it. Um, but I, So I use calipers. Um, I don't like the digital calipers because every time I go to get one, uh, the, the batteries have died on it and it doesn't do any good to me. So I, I like the, you know, who wants a dial indicator on them. Um, anyway, I measured the wire diameter and it turned out to be 0 0.75 inches. Um, let's go over to MathCAD and do some of this stuff. Um, these are various points that we'll need. We'll need that later as a diagram. I just had it in there already. We don't need it just yet. So, wire diameter, 0 0.075 inches. So I just measured that directly. Um, we need to know the mean coil diameter. Let's put this guy up 
here somewhere. There we go. Mean coil diameter. So that would be, you know, how far from one side to the other is this thing going to be. And um, for that, what I did is I measured the outer diameter, which was um, 0, 0.63. And I put 1. Um, it measured that. I don't know if it actually supposed to be that designed that way or not, but that's what I measured. Um, and then we got mean coil diameter just by taking the outer diameter and subtracting off two half wire diameters. So that ends up as one wire diameter. Um, this will give us the mean coil diameter or the average, if you want to think of it that way. Um, I don't want it in meters though. Um, so there we go. We have the mean coil diameter and that looks reasonable. You know, it's a little half inch ish looking spring. So I can go with that. Um, a new thing that we need now, last time in the other springs, compression springs, we had number of active coils. Uh, we had number of um, total coils. Here, we're gonna have something called the number of body coils. So that would be the springs in the body, the coils in the body, um, not including the end hooks. Although we will have to account for the end hooks because they will stretch some too. So I just counted these, like went down one, two, three, four, and there were 21 of them no units on that. Um, from this, we can calculate uh, C. Uh, we'll need C uh, in a second. So C is our spring index, uh, and that's just D divided by D. So mean coil diameter divided by wire diameter. Uh, and it's in a good range of what's recommended. Although you'll see extension springs that are much longer than uh, compression springs usually are, or at least they can be. Uh, you might have some extension springs that are, you know, a foot long or whatever, um, because <clears throat> they don't rely. Obviously, obviously, when you're pulling on it, it's not going to buckle, so it doesn't matter how long it is. Um, so you you will see extension springs with spring indexes that are, you know, outside the range that we had acceptable for compression springs, and that's fine. Um, all right, so this material, I just assumed it was chrome vanadium. Um, that's one of the materials in our book. Let's see if I can find that's early on in the book where it has the material properties. And we need modulus of elasticity and modulus of rigidity. So E and G, we need both of those. I just got to find the chart that it came from. I don't exactly remember what page it's on. Here it is. Table 10 5. So. Um, chrome vanadium is one of them. There's actually two entries here, A231 and A232, but as far as E and G go, they're the same number. So I grabbed uh, 29.5 million PSI for modulus of rigidity, uh, elasticity and 11.2 million PSI for modulus of rigidity. And I plugged those in. Well, we'll do that here. So E, whoops, not R, E is uh, 29. 0.5 times 10 to the 6th. Well, well, let's put units on it though. PSI. And G was 11.2. Okay. Um, and that's assuming that it's chrome vanadium. That's a typical material for this kind of spring, so it seems reasonable. And these numbers are pretty typical for most steels. So, um, it, even if it's not exactly chrome vanadium, then it is something similar. Okay, so one of the first things that I want to do is, so we're more analyzing this spring instead of designing it. You know, it's already designed, so we're analyzing some of the features of it. You could work the other way too and kind of use our process that we're going to do here and work backwards to maybe find wire diameter. You know, you could do that. Um, but we want to know how much force is it going to take to apply to this thing before it even begins to separate. So there's some amount of force that I have to, I have to pull with some amount of force before the coils start to separate. And so that's the preload. I want to figure out that number. Um, so how I'm going to do that um, uses an equation in your book that I don't particularly like it, but it is the equation in your book. And I don't like it for one reason in that um, it has a constant in it and it assumes that uh, you know what the units are. So you have to be careful with this equation. It's 1041 once I get to it. Uh, 
So on the next page. Nope. Where'd it go? Well. There it is. All right. So let's get this equation right here. So um, it's got this number, 33,500. There's no units on it. And this equation will only work, well, you can kind of see over here, they wrote in that it's going to give you PSI. So be careful that you don't go in thinking that uh, this is going to give you uh, anything in the SI system or whatever like that, because uh, it it is specifically devised to produce PSI. So the numbers you put in here are going to give you PSI. Um, so make sure that you are careful with using this equation. Um, and it does, this equation does produce a range. So it's got one term over here, and then it's got a plus or minus term over here. So uh, you put in plus 1,000 and all this stuff, and you get the upper limit, and then uh, minus 1,000, you get the lower limit. A lot of times how you'll see this equation used is you want to be in the middle of the range. So you don't want to be at the far low end or the extreme high end. Um, and so you just leave this part off and just calculate this side. And that'll put you right in the middle of the range, which is typically what you want to do. So this is the preferred range uh, for uncorrected torsional stress. So uncorrected, there are still uh, curvature effects that have to be dealt with. But um, this equation, we're just going to use this half of it, um, but realize that it's going to give us a value in PSI. Um, so we have to deal with that. In fact, I'm going to put the PSI on that 33,000 number uh, in MathCAD so that uh, MathCAD will know what units I'm dealing with. Um, so, oops, here we go with uh, uncorrected torsional shear stress uh, in the body of the extension spring, 33,500. And I'm going to put PSI on that number. Uh, although it doesn't actually specifically say that's where it comes in at. This is an empirically driven equation. They must have done um, uh, you know, a lot of experimental results and figured out uh, that this equation modeled the results they saw. Um, e, so exponential E to the 0 0.105 times C. So we did need our spring index for this equation. Um, and I want it in KSI. So I get 15.4 KSI. That's the middle of the range um, for preferred pretension. So the TI, the I here is telling me that this is the initial condition. So there's some amount of uh, preload or pretension in the spring. Uh, and this amount of stress corresponds to that preload. And so we, we put this, uh, this is in the middle of the preferred range. Okay. <clears throat> now we can go back to the stress equation that we used for the uh, body of a compression spring, use that same exact equation and back out how much force must associate with this. Um, because the springs in the uh, extension spring and in the compression spring, both of them are helical springs, uh, they behave the same way as far as the shear stress in them goes. So we can use the same equation and that's the equation 10. Oh, let me write down. This was equation uh, 1041. And then on this one, this is going to be equation 107, I think. So it's way at the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> so we're going to set uh, tau, although this time we'll call it the initial one. So the preload one. Uh, Bergstrasser would be in here. I'm going to just spell out Bergstrasser versus um, uh, solving for it separately. So that's 4 times C plus 2 over uh, 4 times C minus 3. So that term is the Bergstrasser coefficient KB uh, so that it will account for your um, uh, curvature effect of your coils. And then times 8 times, here is F sub I. So this is the amount of preload force uh, holding the coils together 
times oops, not right. Times uh, mean pole diameter over pi times wire diameter cubed. All right, now I actually shouldn't have set this up as an equation. This is a symbolic. There we go. Because we need to solve for preload. We need to solve for fi. So we're going to go in here and solve. So fi is equal to this guy. <clears throat> and now this number that comes out should be in pounds. Uh, hmm, that's a different number than I calculated last time. What did I do different? Oh, because I did pi times 8. There we go. That's not what we needed to do. Pi times d cubed. So this is, uh, need to resolve that. So not that. And that was a lot of preload because I can pretty easily separate these coils without applying 30 pounds. So that number didn't make sense. So let's resolve. I know that um, when you're seeing MathCAD on this screen, um, you can't see what I'm doing. But up at the top of MathCAD, there's symbolics, variable, solve. You just highlight a variable and you can solve for that variable. So when my cursor's up at the top of the screen, that's what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> this is in MathCAD 15. So fi is equal to this term. Hopefully that gives us a more realistic number. That looks better. And that's more reasonable. I can believe that I'm applying four pounds when I try to separate this guy. I can believe that's about four pounds of pulling. Um, not that my hands are that particularly calibrated, but it certainly wasn't 30 pounds. All right. Um, so that's the amount of force that you have to apply to this extension spring before it, the coils even begin to separate. Um, now we can go and calculate the spring rate after the preload is overcome. So these springs, these extension springs, they work kind of like this. Um, so remember spring rate is force uh, and delta and a, an extension spring with a preload is going to have some amount of force you have to overcome before it even deflects stretches at all so there's some amount of force this would be that force we just calculated and then it's going to have your normal uh, curve after that so this this curve the slope here equals uh, your spring rate F over Delta And so we just calculated this amount. Now, uh, once you apply the four pounds, then you should have a spring rate like you normally would for uh, the compression springs even. All right, so let's figure out that. To do that, um, this is where we need the number of body coils. Um, and, uh, well, we already have the number of body coils, don't we? We said it was 21, 21 body coils, but we need the number of active coils. So, that is a special equation particular to coil springs. Um, it's equation 1040. And it says that the number of active coils obviously equals the number of body coils because they're all active. And then plus this odd term here, G over E. So G over E is a uh, accounting for the end loops. And actually one of the problems in the back of the one well, in the back of the chapter, as you go through and derive G over E. They don't do it in your book, but uh, G over E, the modulus of rigidity over the modulus of elasticity, uh, will go in and account for the fact that as you're pulling on this spring, the coils on the ends, the loops on the ends, will actually uh, affect the spring rate. And so they, that G over E is adding them into the active coils. So if we do this, we started out with 21 active body coils, and then the effects of the end loops adds, you know, another third of a coil. Okay. 
Um, now that we have in A, we can go back to our equation for K, the approximation for K that we've been using. K equals wire diameter to the fourth times modulus of rigidity over eight times mean coil diameter times, and here's the number of active coils. So this will be the spring rate once it's past the preload. Uh, and let's put it in pounds per inch, 12 pounds per inch. So if I want to stretch this thing out one inch, then I have to apply 12 pounds plus the preload. So I have to apply, well, almost 16 pounds to get it to stretch one inch. All right. Um, so that describes the spring. Now we want to calculate some of the stresses in the thing. And there's uh, a couple of different ones that we want to deal with. One of the things we want to deal with is the fact that the end loops themselves might uh, have problems. So we already calculated the stress, or, or we would calculate the stress in the uh, body coils just with this equation 10-7, replacing whatever force you're applying. So if you stretched it one inch, then it would be the uh, 12 plus the preload, so the you know 16 pounds. Plug that in here, and you can calculate the stress in the body coils. But there's two other condition or two other important places, and that's where this diagram comes in. So one, uh, they're labeled point A and point B. So point A is right here. So on our spring, that would be you know kind of our spring doesn't have a full circle loop like in the picture there. It's kind of chopped off a little bit. I mean, it actually goes down in there, but um, somewhere in this region right here, um, point A is what they're talking about. So they're talking about this loop here opening up and basically bending right here. So that's point A. And then point B is this little part right here. So in that case, they're talking about the end loop pulling out this way and uh, having a torsional failure in that notch right in there. Um, different in loops have slightly different geometries, but uh, they can all kind of be generalized to these point A and point B locations. Um, the thing with them is that they have their own curvature effect. So Bergstrasser, you know, this guy right here, doesn't quite apply. Um, there's a similar equation, actually two similar, one for A and one for B, uh, that uh, look you know, they have the same elements in them. They have a spring index, but it's a different C. It's C1 or C2. Uh, and uh, they have a little bit different terms here. So we have to go calculate those. Uh, those are equation 10, 34 and 35 for point, uh, this will be for point A. So equation 1034 is going to give us, actually 1034 is the stress. So we actually have to do 1035 first because 1035 is going to calculate Ka for us. Now in your book, they put it in parentheses. I don't, I can't really do that in MathCAD. So I'm just going to do Ka. Um, and uh, that is the similar, that's the curvature effect for point A, but it's not Bergstrasser. But Actually, before I do Ka, I have to do this term called C1. So I have to create a uh, basically a spring index that is particular to this point. So C1, this is the equation. Well, actually, equation 1035 is two sets of equations split out. Um, so C1 is part of that. And it's two times the radius of the end loop, which we have the uh, mean coil diameter, I guess. So we could use that. Um, because our end loops are basically the same size as a coil and twisted up. Um, so we're going to use the radius of this as the same radius of the body coils. And then we divide this number by D. So in this case, it ends up being the same as uh, oh, lost our free, the regular C. Because of the way that... Uh, we calculated this. Now, not all the time is it true that the radius here, this D over two, um, is gonna be the same diameter. In fact, they have some pictures. You know, see, it's possible that you have a smaller end loop than your body coils. All right, but we don't, we have the same size. Now we can do Ka. It's a little more involved. Four times 
squared minus C1. This is equation 1035 also. Uh, minus 1. All of that divided by 4 times C1 um, times the quantity C1 minus 1. All right. So that is uh, the curvature effect for point A. Now we can go to equation 1034 and uh, calculate the stress. So this is a bending stress. So it's not uh, torsion. So we're going to have sigma at point A. And it's going to equal the force that we're dealing with. Um, so we do have to figure out how much stress, you know, what are we, how much force are we applying here? So we need to figure out how far we're stretching it. So let's go calculate that real quick. Let's just say that we did stretch it one inch. So force is equal to um, the preload force, Fi. So we have to overcome that before anything stretches, plus K times, and then delta, let's say that we stretch it one inch, so one inch. So, and so there's that 16 pounds, basically one inch of stretch plus the preload. Um, and now we can put a value in here. So this stress will be as if we stretch the spring one inch. Uh, so F times uh, this Ka term. And again, in your book, Ka is in parentheses. Let me just show you, make sure we're, because it's going to be more confusing when we start using Kb. Um, so we're talking, there's, there's what it looks like in your book. It's K in parentheses, and then there's going to be a B that I'm just going to use KB because I can't put these parentheses on it. And actually, I didn't try, but I assume I can't put the math, the parentheses in MathCAD. We'll see what happens, but I don't think I can do that. All right, KA, so that's my curvature effect for point A times 16 times mean coil diameter over uh, pi times wire diameter cubed. And then there's another term in here. All of this plus 4 over pi d squared. So here, this is a combined. You kind of see this one looks familiar. It's kind of like the uh, uh, stress that we had for torsion. And then this pi, 4 over pi d squared, but then there's a 16 over here. Um, this is basically your accounting for your bending stress. So um, it's combining the two things together. Um, let's calculate that. KSI, 122 KSI. Uh, that's, you know, that's a lot. Uh, it's not terribly high for a spring material. A lot of times they're stronger than that. But uh, because this is not a shear failure, we're not looking at shear failure here. We're looking at uh, a bending stress. So that's okay. Probably okay. We're not going to do factor of safety, but should be okay. All right. Um, now, uh, let's go ahead and since we have the equation right here, let's calculate the shear stress in the body at that force also. So this isn't it at point A. This is in the body coils, just under the same force. So instead of F sub I, let's put in F. 63 is our uh, KSI in shear. And so that's that's okay for most spring materials. Okay, so that's point A. So that would be, uh, well, this one is point A. So that would be the stress right here, somewhere right in there, as if this coil spring is opening up, trying to straighten out and bend right here, more or less. Um, and then the towel that we did is just, you know, somewhere in the body. <clears throat> They should all be the same. All the coils should be the same. Um, point B, so that's this guy right in here. This it's kind of can see where it twists up. So right in there. So this one, we got to estimate that radius. I estimated it at um, 0.09, I believe. I just measured kind of what I thought it looked like. Um, so these are equation. Um, 1036 and 1037. 
All right, so same process, we have to do a KB. Now this is not Bergstrasser though, this is KB for um, the, uh, point B. So I'll, I really don't think I can put what they did, but actually maybe I can. No, it doesn't like the index. I guess I could do it, but it doesn't. it's not gonna let me do an index with it. I'm not gonna try it. I'm just gonna do KB, but that's not Bergstrasser. Um, four times, now here there's a C2, so we're gonna to have to calculate the spring rate for this point, uh, minus one, four, or spring index, whoops, four times uh, C2 minus four, but we gotta do C2. C2 is two times R2, which to me, uh, I measured it and it looked like it was gonna be 0 0.09 inches for that radius. That radius is shown, you can kind of see it right here. So it's trying to get the radius of that little curve in there. Um, two times R2 over wire diameter, so 2.4. Um, and now we have a KB value. Let's see. Seems reasonable. Now we can calculate um, the stress at this point. Now this one is a torsional stress. So this will be a tau B at, uh, is this KB, again, not Bergstrasser. In fact, All right, KB times uh, eight times F times D over pi D cubed. So same thing that we've been using, but different Bergstrasser, or different uh, curvature correction, not Bergstrasser. Let's do KSI. So 82 KSI, so that's getting higher, um, higher than the body spring. So what this says, is that uh, it looks like the if the spring were to fail in some kind of you know fracture that it would actually be the ends that would fail before the body would fail <clears throat> and you do see that a lot you, you know if you stretch a spring um, hold it by you know the ends and stretch a spring a lot of times you do see the end coils being the thing that straighten out or fail or whatever before the body coils fail so that's not uncommon. Um, okay, so that gives us uh, the calculations for um, the extension springs. So that should do all of that. So now we should be able to calculate all the relevant things for extension springs. Uh, the preload, how much force do you have to apply before it even stretches? Uh, and then failure at point A, failure at point B, we even did body coil stress, although that's uh, probably less likely to be the failure point, uh, but we did do that. Um, so let's move on to these guys. So this one uh, came out of a big clamp, like, you know, the little, little clamps. So these are torsion springs. So they don't stretch, they don't compress, they actually twist. So you've got the, the spring in here, looks like it's gonna do the same thing. You know, it looks kind of like a compression spring or maybe more like an extension spring because it's all stuck together in this case. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, the, you apply a torque to it. So apply a force that creates a moment about the center of this coil. Uh, so there's a torque inside there that we're gonna have to deal with. Um, so I took this spring the bigger one, and I measured it. So let's go back to MathCAD and plug those numbers in. So it has a wire diameter, so I just took and let's get him on the screen, uh, measured the wire again with my calipers. I didn't use a micrometer, but that's just what I had easy to get to. So it was 0.15 inches. Um, I, you do need the mean coil diameter. I got that the same way as I did last time. 
four, six inches. Um, you also need the number of turns. So, you know, how many turns are there here? Um, and you have to be careful with this because um, it does matter where these little, you know, legs, they call them legs, where the legs come off at. So mine come off at more or less 90 degrees. Um, so that means that I have to have four and a quarter turns to get, you know, if I did four turns, they'd both be the same direction. So um, in a line. Uh, so I don't want that. I want it to go four and a quarter turn to get around to where there's this 90 degree or whatever degree you want. Uh, a lot of times it's 90 degrees. So I have the number of turns equal to 4.25. No, I didn't put units on that. That's turns. Um, and then you need the length of the legs. So they, they work like little moment arms. So we need the L1. And they don't have to be the same. In this case, they are. L1 was, uh, they were 1 point, no, they were 2.75 inches. And they were both the same. So L2, the other leg, was the same as L1. So these are all things we measured. I'm gonna assume it's the same material so we don't have to use a new E or G. Um, so we're gonna make it the same chrome vanadium material, although it probably isn't. We're gonna assume it is. All right. Now, there are two equations and your book is, let's look at the book, 1050 uh, and 1051. So I got to get those pulled up right there at the bottom of this page. It's over here. Everything's on the wrong side of the book. All right. So over here, there's these two equations that talk about, and notice, um, so you've got K here, 1049. This K is um, torque per radian. And you've got K prime, you have two K primes, and actually you have a theta prime. But um, these are all spring rates, 1049, 1050, and 1051, they're all spring rates. But um, the difference here is torque per radian for K, and K prime is torque per turn. So you do have to be careful that what you understand the units that you're using that go with each equation. The difference in 50 and 51 is uh, experimental evidence. So this one is derived theoretically uh, and predicts one number here in the denominator 10.2. And then they say that, um, well, they, they attribute it to the effect of friction between the coils and arbor. Um, so they kind of just say, hey, it's probably this, but uh, the experimental results don't show this 10.2 modeling the spring rate very well. Uh, so put 10.8. So that's what it says. Um, so we're going to use 1051. Uh, as the torque per turn spring rate for the torsional spring, and we're going to use the 10.8, which apparently better models the experimental results that you see when you actually put one of these in service. All right, so um, that's equation 1051. So let's go ahead and calculate that. All right, so... Um, I'm going to call this K, and I can't do a prime in here that I know of. So K per turn. So w that'll just remind me that this is not giving me um, radians per, or torque per radian. It's giving me torque per turn, so torque per 360 degrees. So it's just a reminder that you do have to keep these separate. Um, and it says D, so wire diameter to the fourth, times E. Again, we're using the same modulus of elasticity. Uh, that we used for the extension spring, the 29.5. If it's not exactly the same material, it's going to be close to that number anyway. Um, all of this divided by 10.8. Whoops, 10.8. And again, the 1050 equation says 10.2 here. Um, times mean coil diameter times number of uh, active coils, which we haven't calculated yet. So we need to, we have the number of turns, but that's not exactly what they want to use as a number of active coils. So just like with the extension spring, when we did number of active coils, we counted up all of the body coils and then added in an effect for the, the loops on the end. You do the same thing here where you have body coils and then the 
arms or legs coming off of the thing, they also bend a little bit too. And so you have to add that effect in there. So th we have a special equation, um, equation 1048, that will account for the end or the legs. So the number of active coils is going to equal um, the number of turns that we have and then plus um, L1, so this looks L1, so that's the length of leg one, and it, one and two doesn't matter, it's just one is one and one is the other. Um, L2, in our case, they're the same length, divided by three times pi times di D, mean coil diameter. So there's our number of active turns. So we actually had 4.25 real turns, but then when you add these, you know, three inch long legs off the end of it as part of the spring, then you have a equivalent number of active coils that's larger than the 4.25. So here's our, now it came out in joules. Remember this is gonna be torque per turn. So um, we might want that in inch pounds, whoops. I missed the, well, I did it again. Inch, pounds, there we go. Um, so 544 inch pounds. And now this one doesn't have per turn in the units, but this is f per 360 degrees. So if I wanted to take this point, go all the way around and come back to this point, it would take me 544 inch pounds of torque to do that. Something would probably break before I did that, but uh, or yield at least. All right, so now I have K per turn. So let's just say that my goal is to put this spring back in here. So you know it's it's 90 degrees, but it needs to be more you know more like whatever that degree is. I did measure that, and it's kind of like 75 degrees. So I have to go from 90 degrees down to 75 degrees to get it to fit back in the handle. So I'm gonna call that the angle to close and close isn't necessarily, maybe uh, install, let's do install because it's not closing it all the way. We're just gonna, we need to squeeze it down some to install it back in the thing. And so that would be, it starts out at 90 degrees and then I have to get it down to 75 degrees. So you know, 15 degrees. So I've got to squeeze 15 degrees. Um, and so the torque that I need to apply is equal to um, the spring rate per turn, whoops, turn, times how much am I going to turn it? So um, I have angle to install. Divided by um, 360 degrees. So this will tell me how much torque I need to apply. And I want it in inch pounds again. So 23 inch pounds. And now if I want to figure out what kind of force does that relate to. So, you know, if I could, you know, hold this side steady. So kind of anchor that point and push up here, you know, at a perfect right degree angle, how much force do I have to push with to make it close up. So that's that's the same thing as, you know, pulling on both sides. One side staying still and the other side's moving. So how much force do I have to push on here to create the 22.697 inch pounds of torque? So all you do there is the force that I need to do or apply is the torque divided by, and now I'm gonna put L1, and that does assume that I'm able to push the very end of the thing, which you know, probably not practical, but close enough. So it says I need to apply eight pounds of force at the end here to be able to squeeze it down small enough to put it back in the clamp that it came from. Um, that's really all they have for uh, the torsion springs. There's not a lot more complicating things. The rest of your book goes in um, you know, they kind of talk about the 
they do have a bending stress in there that we could have uh, calculated, I guess. Um, here's another example on this page of closing a spring up a leg. In fact, it's doing the same thing that we just did, although it's... Am I zoomed really far in? No, we just got to get further out. There we go. So basically doing what we just did. Um, they have a chapter on Belleville Springs. Those are a particular type of spring that... Um, you kind of see a picture of it over here. They look like little washers that are cupped and you can stack them in different arrangements to um, create different flat springs, sort of. Um, here's kind of a, uh, a flat spring uh, that has a, a wound part and a cantilever part. Here's a volute spring. So it's uh, it's a, like a, well, you can kind of see over here, it's kind of like a triangle that's been wrapped up. Um, and that's it. They don't have any other springs, but there are other... Um, like a leaf spring would be similar to this uh, and then there's a torsion rod uh, where you basically just take a, a rod and the, the spring comes by twisting it um, so there are other types of springs that aren't mentioned in here also but we're gonna really just focus on the regular torsion springs the coil torsion springs and uh, the extension and compression springs Okay, I think that is all we need to know about springs for the time being. Uh, next time we'll move on. I'm not even sure what we're doing next, but uh, it won't be springs. It'll be something new. Uh, all right. Thank you all. See you next time.